Hello, and welcome to Deaf Artists Backstage. My name is Joey Caverly. And every week, I've been hosting a live session with different deaf artists and performers from across the United States, talking about their journeys, successes, failures, and struggles. As you can see now, we are offering captioning. We also have voice interpretation services now. The captions are auto captions, which means they will not be 100% accurate. And for that, we apologize. If you have any questions that you would like to ask the artist today, please feel free to shoot that in the comments section. I'm very proud to introduce our esteemed guest this week, none other than Annie Weigand. Please help me welcome Annie. Hi. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I was watching a TV show recently, and it was on Disney Plus, The Mandalorian. That's still on my watch list. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> and watching the whole thing through, I just kept thinking, if I was in the Star Wars universe, which character would I be? Imperial? Who, which, which side would you be on? Which group would you join? Clearly the rebel forces. Because I support the Jedi universe. Leia, Luke, and now you have Ren. So of course, the rebel side. You? I think that I would be one of those innocent civilians who had no idea that the war was even happening. <laughs> of course. I think I'd be one of those people. Gotcha. Now, I'd love to dive into the interview. If you could take me back to your formative years and just tell me what brought you into theater. So that's going to take my whole life story, basically. I was born and raised in Des Moines, Minnesota. And I grew up not far from a very successful community theater. And we started going to shows with my mom at three or four. Uh, I actually started taking a mime class there at the theater. And that was the beginning. And it just stuck with me. Again, as I said, they had a very strong theater program there. And there was the Playhouse not too far from that, right next to the community center. So I grew up with that influence from a very young age and became my livelihood. Now, if I understand your timeline correctly, after you graduated, you went to Gallaudet University. You were a student there for a short time. Yes. And then you decided to transfer to Appalachian State University. Mm -hmm. That's correct in North Carolina. Can you explain the rationale beh behind choosing that university? Sure. Back in high school, my theater experience was more in performing. I had done a little bit of design and I remember specifically doing Once on This Island and the set for that. It was just off Broadway at the time so I remember helping design the set for that in high school. And that was my first experience with designing. And as I said, mostly I did performing. And then when I got into Gallaudet, I still wasn't sure where I fit in theater. At that time, the head of the theater department was Jeff Grenell. And I don't know if you remember Jeff. <clears throat> I really took a liking to him and he was a light designer by trade. So because I got along so well with him, I helped him design and set and hang lights for Gallaudet Productions. And then at the same time, I was sort of getting tired of DC. This was back in the late 90s. That area was very different. Me being from 
the cornfields of the Midwest, the very young, naive girl coming into D.C. Northeast at that time was very different than it is now. So the Appalachian University is in the boonies of North Carolina, out in the west near the Appalachian Mountains, and it's just a gorgeous region, beautiful college town, entirely different than Gallaudet in the center of Washington, D.C. At that time, again, I was still struggling where I wanted to specialize in the arts. And North Carolina is completely different now than it was at that time. But those were some of the reasons. I fell in love with that area. I fell in love with their theater program. And they had a bachelor's in theater that's focused in design. So that's what I had decided I wanted to do in theater. And I made that my choice. And that's the program that I chose to graduate from. <clears throat> I'm sure that that was a difficult transition for you. You were likely the only deaf person in that area or at that school. What did accommodations look like or what was the university's response to you becoming a student on campus? How did that process work for you? It really all worked out in the end. I had two interpreters. It just so happened that there were two that lived there in that college town for Appalachian State University. Other than that, there weren't interpreters for several towns over. So I just lucked out. Um, the staff there at the university were all very accommodating, very supportive. I felt very comfortable and safe in that environment there. And it just worked out beautifully. And you were focusing specifically on light design while there? Not specifically light design, but design in general. So I did scenic design, light design, costume design, and sound design as well. I took courses in sound design, but I never actually designed any shows of sound. Why because, not? Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, it, it was actually really good to take those classes to enjoy the complexities that go into it but I focused on the other three throughout my tenure at the university. So you were able to graduate with your bachelor's degree, and then you decided to go on and go to uh, Boston University to get your MFA, your master's in fine arts. What made you choose going on to get an advanced degree in fine arts? That's a great question. During college, my field of work seemed to be moving towards costume design. And so I ended up being a costume maker at Shakespeare Theater Company. I was in their costume shop. You made it back to DC. I did, yes. I worked with the Glimber Glass uh, Poetry Group and again, costumes was my background at that time. And on, honestly, my family, I come from a long line of seamstresses and dailers. So that just sort of is part of my blood. I ended up working for a couple years with the Shakespeare Theater Company. And that was just an amazing experience. But I missed the stage. I missed having the opportunity to be involved with the artists and contribute to the story other than just sewing costumes. It's basically all I did there. And I decided I wanted to do something more. So I went back to school to focus more on my designing experience and decided to do light design because of Jeff. I just looked back and remembered so fondly my experience in undergrad at Gallaudet University. And I started looking into light design and masters of fine arts in Boston had a great program. And I went through their three-year MFA. I had also considered going on to get an MFA. And I've thought about it for, uh, gosh knows, X number of years now. But for whatever reason, I can't really seem to, to do it, to, to make the leap into graduate school and get an MFA. So what kind of questions should I be asking myself about whether or not I should attend an MFA, whether or not it's worth it? 
That is a great question. And honestly, I wish I had asked myself that question. <laughs> but now looking back on my experience, I can give you some advice. You want to make sure that you're looking for a program that will accommodate your needs. It's important to talk with your mentors, see who they are, talk to them, and also look at the university. Who would you be studying under? Do you relate to them? I was specifically looking for a strong theater community, which Boston has, and I constantly find myself going back to Boston. And knocking on wood, hopefully after the pandemic, I'll be able to do that because of their strong theater community. <clears throat> so you wanna think about access, who your mentors would be in whatever program you choose and the location of the program you choose that it has a strong theater or performing arts community. <clears throat> sure, those are all things to definitely be to consider. Now for actual programs, once you graduated with your MFA, what did you feel like you gained from that experience? You had your bachelor's degree and uh, let's say you went, you went straight into work without that MFA. So do you, can you talk a little bit to the differences and experiences? That's actually a great question, which also adds to another thing you should ask yourself is what does the program involve? Boston University had amazing opportunities and I didn't know where I was going to be designing after I graduated. I did probably 15, 20 shows throughout the program in addition to some internships and small uh, performance areas and large proscenium stages. So I got a lot of experience from that program and I was able to show people my portfolio I ended up having a website that showed my designs. And it's a little bit harder to have that experience when you're going through a bachelor's degree program. There's less of a track record of what you've done as an undergraduate student as opposed to a master's student. <clears throat> Every de designer should go on to get an FMA or a MFA. Is that a fair statement? Well, that depends on what opportunities you, you have. If you can get direct design experience without that, that's great, good on you. It, but it's gonna be a stroke of luck at that point without having a program to walk you through it. So after you graduated from Boston University with your MFA, did you have an apprenticeship or an internship? I know that it was at the Hangar Theater it was an internship or well fellowship is what they called it. Okay. Uh, a fellowship. Let me make sure that I'm spelling this correctly at the Chautauqua theater company in upstate New York, both hangar and Chautauqua are in upstate New York. Uh, you and I were able to sit down and have a conversation uh, about the benefits of an internship or apprenticeship experience. And I think that those are, amazing and useful. Was it useful for you or essential? <clears throat> yes. And for all recent graduates, I believe it is essential. I would strongly encourage anyone, even if you're a little bit nervous about getting access or working with hearing uh, individuals in the theater community, you need that experience. <clears throat> so it's not just the hangar theater and it, that was one of them and it actually is in an old um, hangar is where the theater is and then Chautauqua and also the Glimmerglass poetry group were all different types of fellowships that I had <clears throat> and that's really how I was able to network and meet people and develop my reputation in the theater community and I still have connections with people I met there years ago today <clears throat> A lot of learning the arts is trial by error. I remember we had a very tight time frame for one show and we really had to rush a lot of our designing and setting. And that was a great experience for me. It was really 
part of what got me to where I am today. In terms of the internship process, do you think that today's theater companies are more receptive to the idea of receiving a deaf artist as compared to historically, let's say even 10, 15 years ago? Absolutely. Prior to the pandemic, I had noticed that my work opportunities for design had grown exponentially. In theater, you get yourself a reputation. You start working with more regional theaters and those open new doors as your name gets out there. And in a very short amount of time in the last 10 years, I've seen the performing arts just become more aware, more open. I've seen more transparency and willingness to work with deaf artists. In all of your work that you've done to date, including the design work. Joey, I think you froze a little bit. Is it getting better? You're coming back, yeah. No, it froze again. Well, dang it. Better? <clears throat> All right. Oh, no. We'll be back in a second. My apologies for the technical issues. It looks like we've got it resolved now. Uh, going back to the original question that I was asking, in all of your studies, everything that you learned, your internships, fellowships, was there ever a moment where you were able to step back and say, you know what, I know my shit and I can do this? I mean, <clears throat> yes and no. I am confident in my abilities to help tell the story and set the scene that's happening on stage through my light production. At the same time, you never stop fixing a show until I never do, at least until opening or until I'm told to stop. You're always finessing the design until the show opens. I'm also constantly learning. As a new artist, and my recommendation for other new artists is to keep an open mind and know that you will always learn. Be open to feedback, learn from your colleagues and learn from others. And I learn from students that I work with. I've also learned from people who have been doing this for decades. It's an important quality to have for any artist is to be open to learning. Could you describe a moment in your career that's really sparked joy for you in the design process? In terms of learning or my artwork? Uh, in terms of anything, really. Just looking back on, a, on something that you've done and is there just anything that you feel really proud of? Wow, I'm sure there are many of those moments, but one that comes to mind is a few years ago, I was doing two shows in a wrap, which means I was hired to design the lights that would accommodate both shows to run at the same time. That was at the Alabama Shakespeare Festival in Montgomery, Alabama.
And the two shows were Steel Magnolia and one that's newer, Into the Breaches, like your pants, like what our grandma called our pants, breeches. So on Tuesday night, they would do Steel Magnolias. Wednesday night, they would do Into the Breaches. And so those shows were running simultaneously on the same stage. During tech rehearsals for Into the Britches, one of the actors had to exit the stage and a light cue was based on the slamming of a door that happens off stage. And I really struggled with that cue because it's auditorily based and it's a major light change. It just never really felt right during the tech rehearsals. And one of my favorite things about design is the collaborative process. So I was working with the sound designer and the director trying to figure out how we were gonna make this auditory cue work. And I asked if they had a Foley door. Foley means to make sound with specific things. So you actually have a small device, it's called a Foley door, and they just happened to have one in storage and they brought it and they loved it. Of course, as a deaf designer, me suggesting that was just funny and hilarious to everyone, but it worked. And that's what happens in the design and through the collaborative process. That's amazing. Is light design a male dominated industry? 100%, yes. I would say similar to deaf artists becoming more a part of the scene, it's the same for women showing up in light and set design as well. And that's been happening in the last few years. And that again is both in lights and electrics. I started in the late 2000s and it was very male dominated at the time. But over the last 10, 11 years, I've seen that shift. Would the same concept apply to whiteness? Is it a white dominated field? Yes, a very white male dominated field. So as a white deaf female light designer, what do you think that you could do to help shift that mindset? That's an amazing question, which is part of why I am teaching now. I'm trying to recruit more deaf students, deaf BIPOC students specifically to get into design. And I don't think that we as deaf artists are taken advantage of enough. A lot of deaf artists don't get into design. They do writing, they do acting, but there's not a lot of us in design. And I do see it more in supporting of the work, building the sets, doing the costumes and all of that in those fields, but not the design aspect of it. And that's part of why I wanted to become a teacher is to recruit more people like me, more black indigenous people of color who are deaf into the fields. You had mentioned you're now teaching at Gallaudet University. Uh, do you see any of those students growing interest in working in some of those technical fields? And if so, what are the first steps that they should take? Internships after graduation, and I will always come back to that. You will find that through those internship experiences, doors open. And I know you and I have had this conversation before when studying theater and graduating, there'll be about 70% of those graduates who quit the field within the first year or so, because it is difficult. Uh, and that is an undeniable truth. And it's been interesting for me to be working on the technical side. I do carpentry work. I help build sets. There is a lot of work out there on the technical side of things. The creative aspect is much more competitive, 
but the technical side of the theater world has plenty of opportunities. So what do you think that the barrier is? Why don't we have enough deaf people working in those technical fields? I think part of it's awareness. Um, some of it's internal motivation isn't there. I don't think that the job opportunities are well promoted for students to know that that's an opportunity. If you want to go into the creative parts of fine arts, that's totally fine. Do what makes you happy. But I think the biggest part of why there's a lack in the technical field of theatrics is lack of awareness. And I think that's changing with the younger generation. I can recall several years ago now, you and I sitting down to have a conversation where you had said that, well, you're a current New York City resident. Yes. And the rationale for living in the New York area is because of the theater companies and producers looking for light designers. And if they see that you live in or around New York City, you have a higher chance of being hired for that job as compared to living out of state. Do you still believe in that? I did. I do see that changing, especially because of the Black Lives Matter movement. I think there has been a lot of attention on the theatrical process and looking at regional equity because not everyone can afford to live here in New York City. So I live in the New York City area, but I actually live in New Jersey across the bridge because it's cheaper and more affordable. I can see the Empire State Building and the skyline of New York from my window but I am in New Jersey because it's cheaper. But I do see a lot of that changing as the pandemic starts to dissipate and we go back to theater in terms of wanting people from New York. I think there's going to be a lot more regional hiring, even though New York City still has a reputation to it. Okay, it actually looks like Joshua Castile has a question. What kind of light style do you like to design? Or what do you feel would be best for deaf visibility in terms of light design and theater? Uh, and what makes it difficult? And how do you make that work? There were a lot of questions in that. <laughs> um, Joey, can you ask it in another way? Yes. So what's maybe one of your favorite types of light design that is best fit for deaf theater? Well, for deaf productions, it's very important that you think about the direction of the light. Hearing audience members can take advantage of being able to look away from the action and still hear what's going on. But if you're doing a deaf theater or a deaf performance and there's a sound that happens across the stage from the action, you need some sort of lighting cue to draw people's attention. So you have to think about that. You have to visually guide the audience and that's frequently done through the lighting about which actions to look at that are going on on stage. So that's a very important thing to think about when you're looking at deaf performances as opposed to standard hearing performances. I also love selective lighting, which means you're lighting from one side, be it the left side of the actor or directly from behind the actor, or even with strong colors. That's nice to do in a lot of the shows that we design, but if you're doing a deaf theatrical performance, you have to think about being able to see the sign language, being able to see the facial expression. So you can work with shadows, but you can't do that pure one-sided light. I know that you are an assistant light designer for Spring Awakening. Yes. I was actually the second assistant. It was a huge team. 
but yeah. And I know that that was a deaf performance that was run by Deaf West. It had deaf actors in it. It had deaf light designers involved. How much was your input valued as a deaf artist? Actually, a lot. And this is another example of why networking is so important. Ben Stanton, who's a Broadway light designer, was the lead designer on that. And I had worked with him at the university at the Chautauqua Theater. And I found out that he was going back to Broadway and I made sure to make a connection with him. Ben is an amazing person. I was very grateful to work with him. And I had a lot of different roles in that team. Primarily it was to make sure that the lighting worked for a deaf performer and for a deaf audience. The actor who played Mortiz, and I can't remember the exact name of the song. It was the really, really sad one. Sadness? Oh yeah. I mean, it's right before a very, very sad moment in the show. He had a follow spot on him. So he's moving around the set, signing the song with a follow spot. And at the end of the song, he had this beautiful way that he translated the lyrics. And it was just gorgeous. And it really vibed with the music and the emotion of the show. But during the preview, the follow spot operator started to fade out the follow spot into a pin spot at the very top of that beautiful line and that beautiful translation. So you weren't able to see the end of the song. You missed out on that because the follow spot closed too quickly. And so we really had to work with them on the timing for that. And I talked with Ben and I explained why and that what the issue was and they fixed it immediately so that you were able to see the end of that beautiful song. So I was, Really proud of myself for catching that. <laughs> Which leads me into my next question. You and I have worked together in the past uh, and we also, we worked together. The Noise Off was our first show that we worked together. And then you and I worked on some shows at Gallaudet and in looking over your CV or your resume, I noticed that our time together was not listed there. And I didn't know if it was just so traumatizing that you decided to delete it from your CV or <laughs> what happened there? No, I loved Noises Off from Gallaudet University. Um, that was selected work at the university level. And I've chosen to just include my professional level work because I've done so many shows. I've chosen to highlight those, but it wasn't anything against you. I'm sorry. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're about out of time now, but I did want to offer you the opportunity to share any final thoughts before we wrap up today's session for those who may be interested in getting into the field or who are currently studying to get into the field. Be adamant about what you want to do. Be resilient. And keep coming back. Keep believing in your dream. Do not give up. There are moments where I remember crying, feeling like I wouldn't be able to go back to work. I wouldn't be able to make it with that, but you have to keep believing in yourself and believing that you will make it and do beautiful art. I look forward to doing some with you. Thank you so much for taking time today to be a part of this interview. I really appreciate it. For our viewers, this is our final interview for the year. Thank you so much for diligently tuning in to our 24 episodes of Deaf Artists Backstage. I hope to see you again next year. And remember, stay safe and wear a mask.
Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.